Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone, and everyone, and welcome. My name is David Freeman. I'm the editorial director of NBC News Mach, that's M-A-C-H. Um, I'm also the moderator for today's panel discussion, which is entitled Stroke, Successes and Setbacks with a Notorious Silent Killer. Um, stroke prevention, treatment, and recovery in the U.S. is really a remarkable success story with many lives saved over the past few decades. But recently, there's been a worrisome new trend of people having strokes at earlier ages, and progress against stroke has stalled in some parts of the country. What's driving these trends and what innovations and technologies might help curb them? To help answer these questions, we have our esteemed panel here today with us, uh, starting from my right, um, Janet Wright, who is Executive Director of the Million Hearts effort at the CDC and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Umberto Campia, cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Gokhan Hodomishlagil, who is Chair of the Department of Genetics and Complex Diseases at the Harvard Chan School, and also joining us remotely is Walter Korschatz, who is director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Uh, this event is being presented jointly with NBC News Digital. It's also part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn forums, and we're pleased to have the Cohn family today. Um, uh, we're streaming live on the websites of the forum and MSNBC News, and NBC News Mock. We're also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, the program will include a brief Q&A uh, at the end, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum site uh, right now. Excuse me. So to set the stage, let's take a look at a video from NBC Nightly News about younger people having strokes. We're back with a new warning about the alarming rise in strokes for a surprising age group. At a time when strokes are declining in older Americans, they're also skyrocketing for younger adults. NBC's Erica Hill has more on the risk factors you may not have heard about until now. Always active, Chelsea Colangelo thought she was healthy until she collapsed at age 28 with a stroke. It's scary because you can't move and you can't speak. This is Colangelo just a few weeks after. No vacuum cleaners. Trying to read a children's book. She had to relearn how to communicate, walk and dress. Well, left side, it's numb, pain. Strokes aren't often associated with people in their 20s or even their 40s, yet those numbers are on the rise. A new study by researchers at the University of Southern California found over 10 years, there's been a 44% increase in strokes for 25 to 44-year-olds, while strokes for those over 65 decreased. The big question, why is this happening? Among the risk factors, according to scientists, sports injuries, hormonal changes from birth control, undiagnosed heart defects, and an increase in diabetes and obesity. While the vast majority of strokes every year, 90%, affect those over 50, experts say the symptoms of a stroke may be less recognized by younger people. A sudden loss of control in your nervous system, symptoms that spell fast, facial drooping, arm weakness, and speech difficulty, all signs it's time to call 911. Now, more than a year after her stroke, Chelsea has made remarkable progress. While she may never know what caused it, she hopes it will serve as a wake-up call for others. Erica Hill, NBC News, New York. We saw some of the risk factors there, but this is your field. So what's going on here with this uh, increased incidence of uh, stroke in these young people? Yes, why is this thief, this villain, this stroke sneaking back in, and why is it getting to our younger uh, age group? Um, uh, 
studies that came out in around the same time as the one that was featured in that clip showed that uh, death rates from stroke have stalled across the country. You all know we've been seeing this beautiful decline in both heart disease and stroke deaths for 50 years, dramatic decline. And that has begun to flatten or plateau and in some places go up. And in fact, if you look at a map of the United States, one of the things that's most striking is that stroke is no longer just a stroke belt issue anymore. We are seeing this stalling of stroke death rates from Maine to California and states that where you would uh, be shocked. We also looked at hospitalizations for stroke and saw this rise in hospitalizations in the 35 to 54 year olds, uh, actually 18 to 54 year olds more of that age group being hospitalized. And when we took a close, closer look at those folks, many of them had stroke risk factors, the classic stroke risk factors, even though they were uh, 18 to 54 years old. One of the metrics from one of those studies looked at those that had three to five risk factors, so really a lot of risk for stroke. And it was a dramatic, it had doubled in a 10 year period in that age group. So I don't think it's a mystery why we're seeing these. Decades of obesity, physical inactivity, and diabetes, those three interwoven uh, factors, are eventually now having an impact um, on event rates. Just quick, you mentioned the stroke belt. There's things happening outside the stroke belt. Tell people about the stroke belt, where, where that is. Yes, the stroke belt is typically known as the southeast part of the United States. It's where I grew up. Uh, very high density of strokes and heart attacks for many years now. Okay. Alberto, you treat patients, so you're clinicians, so yes. what are you seeing in your office? Yeah, it's, it's very important to uh, highlight the fact that there has been a group of younger people that have suffered from stroke from causes that are sort of uh, not under our control, such as having a defect in the heart or having some uh, clotting uh, abnormalities. Those are not the ones that we see more often. The ones that we see more often are the younger patients that have uh, uh, lost their uh, control of activity, so they're very uh, sedentary. They have uh, increased their weight. They have uh, mm, engaged in very unhealthy lifestyle, particularly with regards to uh, eating habits, increase uh, calorie amount, increase sodium intake, and uh, decrease in their uh, activities. This leads to the uh, onset of what we call the metabolic syndrome, which is a state in which the uh, body uh, is a, in, a, in an abnormal uh, environment with regards to inflammation. Also, there is an abnormal lipid environment. The cholesterol is not particularly high, however, the good cholesterol is low. The uh, normal chole the uh, bad cholesterol is relatively increased, but this combination is particularly dangerous. This causes damage to the vessels. And in association with the high blood pressure, this leads to the early onset of atherosclerosis. So we are seeing more and more of these patients. And unfortunately, it, the uh, mm, uh, understanding of the risk associated with the early onset uh, of these risk factors is really not uh, widespread. And many times I see patients that come to me young, obese, hypertensive, who are not uh, given the appropriate advice about exercise, who are not on blood pressure medications, and who are not on appropriate um, uh, treatment for their uh, obesity. So uh, Walter, uh, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, of course, is responsible for a lot of research on stroke. So what do you see as the areas that we should be focusing on in light of these um, kind of worrisome new trend? On stroke is, goes back many, many decades. And uh, the, I think the answer is actually staring us in the face. And that is that uh, the major driver of stroke is hypertension. The second most important driver is hypertension, and the third most important driver is hypertension. And we think that 30% of the people in the United States have hypertension, and only half of those have their blood pressure controlled. So uh, in our sense, from looking at the data, uh, the challenge to the U.S. is putting into practice what we already know, and that is people need to know their blood pressure, and they need to get their blood pressure under control. 
The controversial area is how low we should drive the blood pressure. Uh, un unfortunately, all the data that we have so far shows the lower the blood pressure, the lower the risk of stroke. We don't know where the bottom is right now, but we do know that lowering blood pressure will decrease your risk of stroke, and that is, you know, basically so, the evidence is so clear that we really need to act on that in this country. Just a quick question. So is the 120 over 80 target doesn't really hold anymore for people who are trying to control their blood pressure who are at risk for stroke? Well, as I, that I think is the area that we don't really know wh how low we should be going. Uh, we recently funded a study at an NIH called the SPRINT study, which was aggressive blood pressure lowering and uh, below the 120. And uh, the study had to be stopped prematurely. Mortality rates were so much lower in the lower blood pressure group, mm. and uh, that the only caveat there being that those patients were people who had risk factors, kidney disease, heart disease. Oh, so in that high risk group, you should go even lower than what was previously the 140 over 80 regimen. What we don't know is how that applies yet to the general population who does not have those risk factors. Right. Okay, thank you. Gokhan, uh, you researched uh, basic biology of stroke, um, so looking at what happens inside the body to put people at risk for metabolic dis uh, disorders. Um, tell us more about what you're learning in your, in your uh, research. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, I think I'll start by saying that I'm not really an expert on stroke, mm -hmm. but uh, more study the processes that uh, establish the risk factor uh, for stroke and uh, vascular disease, both in the periphery and uh, in the brain. And so I guess the, the, one of the main things I would mention is that there is a tremendous similarity between how the, the body fails, uh, either during aging or obesity, and the brain fails using very, very similar mechanisms. And I want to put things in perspective. I mean, although for example, when you have diabetes, the risk for stroke uh, g increases by two to fourfold. So on the surface, it may appear as a low number, but the magnitude of this is tremendous. Uh, the, the reason for that is in the US, for example, uh, one out of every 10 individual has diagnosed diabetes. One out of every three individuals is estimated, and this is a really alarming number, to have prediabetes. So they are destined to develop diabetes, or they have signs of diabetes, but they're not yet aware of it, or it's not diagnosed. And uh, of course, again, depending on the numbers, one out of three or one out of four has obesity. So th such a large section of the population is influenced by these risk factors that it really contributes a, a tremendous amount of uh, burden on the health system and the welfare of people and quality of life. And uh, so I think the, the, the reason that we study why, for example, similar things happen and could these be exploited for treatment of stroke, but perhaps together with the treatment of diabetes, insulin resistance, hypertension, uh, obesity, and other metabolic abnormalities and inflammatory problems, which are very closely interwoven to address uh, the, the problems of people suffering from stroke or the, the risk uh, for stroke. And uh, so th there are, I mean, many things. Actually, in, in this school, we have a whole department devoted to study these risk factors. And uh, so they include, uh, for example, uh, inflammation, uh, both in the peripheral body uh, with these risk factors and in the brain, uh, there is chronic inflammation. So this is different inflammation than what happens, for example, when you sprain your ankle. It is a, a low-grade inflammation that is not resolved. There are uh, abnormalities in, uh, in lipid composition, but not limited to lipids, many other metabolic abnormalities at the neuronal level in the brain, but also in the peripheral tissues. And lastly, perhaps the defense system. So our bodies are equipped with defense systems to deal with stresses, damage, insults, noxious events, but these, these management systems also fail in the course of this metabolic abnormalities or obesity, for example. Therefore, not only you increase your risk, but you also reduce your ability to deal and recover uh, with the insult. 
So at many layers, uh, these problems contribute to the problem, both emergence and the prognosis uh, at the same time. Okay, so we've talked a bit about some of the drivers of stroke, but um, let's talk about innovations now. Here's another clip from NBC News that describes a procedure that saves lives by removing blood clots. But another part of the, of the story is the um, importance of new guidelines about when doctors should use it. A simple walk with her dog is a miracle for Cynthia Dodd. Less than a year ago, the 46-year-old suffered a massive stroke in her sleep. I would have died, and if I did live, I would be complete vegetable. By the time she was found in the morning, it had been more than six hours, which had been considered too late to remove the brain clot and save the patient. But now, new guidelines from the American Stroke and Heart Associations say doctors have up to 24 hours to use clot-busting devices like this thin wire. It's a massive game changer. We've had these devices now for a period of time, but now we've expanded the window that we can intervene and act on patients. And that's the life-saving part. Life-saving and improving their recoveries. One study found that expanding the window of time to even 16 hours cut in half the number of deaths and severe disability. With these treatments, you more than double the chances of someone being independent in the time after their stroke rather than being severely disabled. It's still crucial to get to the ER right away. Luckily, Cynthia Dodd was sent to Stanford Hospital, already testing this approach. I knew that I was lucky to be alive. But when you see your brain up on that computer and you're like, that was me? Like, how am I even sitting here? Now this mother appreciates even the simplest moments, thanks to a radical change giving doctors more time to treat. Dr. John Torres, NBC News, New York. So, um, Walter, what are some of the uh, advances in stroke treatment that the, um, that the Institute is particularly interested in? Well, I, I, I want to just emphasize the message that you just heard, which... Um, I had the opportunity of being in the development of these technologies years ago before I came to NIH when I ran the stroke program at Mass General. And it's nothing but a miracle to see someone come in with is clearly going to be a fatal or completely disabling stroke. Uh, but then when you remove the clot and the blood flow goes back to the brain, the patient walks out of the hospital seemingly the way they were before they had the stroke. So. It is an incredible miracle. Now, the one piece that I don't want people to misinterpret is the business of the timing. Let me be clear, the, when the blood flow to the brain is cut off, the brain cells start dying within minutes. Um, what we've learned is through using advanced imaging technologies that we can look into the brain and see, my, see how much has been damaged and how much is still ready to be salvaged. And that sets the decision making to intervene. But from what I've said, it's pretty clear the sooner you intervene, the less damage is going to be. What we did find out is that there are some people out to 16 hours, say, who still have brain tissue that can be salvaged but they are the vast minority. They are exceptions. So it is critically important that this time window expansion, it's, not, it, it's a very small group that actually benefits from that time window expansion. People really have to get into the hospitals very quickly for this technology to help them, or else they'll be excluded because they get the brain scan and there's nothing left to save anymore. Um, but I, the other thing to add is that what's happened, oh, since the NIH study of uh, thrombolytic therapy for stroke in the mid-90s, the way stroke is practiced has changed dramatically across the U.S. Uh, because now um, the challenge is to provide these therapies to people incredibly rapidly. And before 1990s, that was not the case, and people would languish because there was very little one could do for them. But the strain on the hospital systems to change how they treat stroke, to communicate with the ambulance drivers so that not a second is lost is what has really changed how stroke is cared for in the U.S. But it is something that's been tough to do because of the financial strains of many of the hospitals. So we, we face a broad inequity in the United States in terms of people's access to these therapies that the hospital systems are still now trying to equalize. Well, we'll talk about disparities again in a bit, but I want to go to Gokhan about your perspective, uh, more about, I guess, drug, drug focus rather than interventions. 
for med or surgical interventions? Yeah, I think uh, I'm on the drug end, there are m many, many uh, extremely promising technologies uh, developing. And that th maybe they could be ca categorized and we can come back to this. But of course, one thing I want to mention is stroke, uh, like many other diseases that we do, uh, we use a very broad term actually to cover many different types of diseases. So stroke is not a, a single disease. And uh, th I mean, there are broad categories for, for, for example, hemorrhagic versus ischemic, m meaning uh, due to bleeding versus due to uh, cutting off uh, the blood supply to the brain. Both can, can cause. Obviously, these will have different types of approaches uh, to deal with. And then under each, of course, there are many different categories. And uh, so the, of course, the, the, the best uh, solution would be not to really see patients having stroke. So that means uh, developing a panel of markers that could be predetermined. And depending on the risk profile, people can actually be put on preventive measures, whether they're primary or secondary preventive measures, so that they really do not have to face uh, the, the, the burden of the disease and, and, and the potential consequences. So there, I think the key is really dealing with the risk factors. And I mean, we heard some of those, dealing with hypertension, dealing with uh, metabolic disease through both lifestyle changes, dietary changes, but also I think more and more now it's becoming uh, quite likely that these will be intervened by uh, very simple and low risk uh, medications. And uh, the uh, second area of drug development, of course, is to uh, increase the possibility of recovery. So uh, some people eventually will suffer uh, from stroke. And how can we help in addition to removing the blockade or uh, stopping the bleeding? How can we help brain to, to recover? So there, I think, uh, also, I mean, tremendous uh, progress, uh, both in medications which will uh, prolong the time. So they could be even administered at the time of diagnosis uh, until the time that intervention could be made. That will increase this, the chance of survival for, for brain cells. And uh, so even when you open, let's say, a, a, a blockade in, in a vessel that is feeding the brain, that itself can actually create problems. So this is called ischemia reperfusion injury. So, uh, and this is of course also a time uh, dependent event and also dependent on the magnitude of the blockade. But there are interventions now that could be employed which will reduce the chances of this injury so that when the blood flow is restored, nutrient flow, oxygen flow to the brain is restored, the, cha the cells have the maximum capacity to recover. And uh, lastly, I would say, uh, although this has not yet uh, broadly entered clinical practice, I think perhaps the, the last uh, avenue would be to replace or repair the damage. And uh, so some, uh, for example, neurons will die, and of course it is not possible to revive the dead uh, neurons, so they need to be replaced or re-derived uh, from their neighboring cells or cells that can that have the ability to give rise and, and replenish these populations. And for those that are not quite dead, but uh, severely dysfunctional, there will be interventions to actually uh, recover them close to their normal functions. So these will be the, 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 the general areas. But I think I'm, I'm really most interested in areas that uh, we can uh, develop better diagnostic tools, better biomarkers, and better preventive interventions that, uh, than what we have at the moment. Well, thank you. Well, Walter's mentioned uh, some of these disparities, and of course you alluded to the disparities as well. So, uh, Janet, tell us uh, what, what's going on with these uh, disparities. What are the disparities and why do they exist? Yes, they're, uh, in addition to the age one that we talked about, um, we, we know for, for years now that uh, African Americans and blacks suffer a higher rate of stroke, uh, and it relates back to the higher rate of uh, lack of control of blood pressure. We've seen great advances in African American and black populations who are now very much aware of hypertension. We've seen increases in treatment, but the control rates are still flagging far behind. And as Walters pointed out, um, 
African Americans in stro uh, with hypertension have uh, a much higher risk of stroke than uh, a white person who might have that same blood pressure, almost three times the risk of stroke. So there's something going on there that's intrinsic to that subset of the population. We've also seen increases in stroke death among Hispanics um, at a 6% rise per year over a couple of years, uh, 2012, I believe, in 2013. So these are very frightening uh, changes. Um, what we are coming to understand, and this sort of gets back to Gokhan's wonderful point, is the best stroke is the stroke that got prevented, <laughs> the stroke that never happened, is that the, the things that work we know what works. We know what works to prevent stroke. We know what works to prevent heart attack. And it's not, those things are not getting implemented everywhere for everyone. Those things that need to be working in the community where people live and work, um, and those things that have to happen in healthcare. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. So, so Umberto, with your patients, you're treating, seeing patients all the time who have issues. So what, what's your perspective on uh, people who are struggling with some of these risk factors. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is really at the focus of our intervention. First of all, we should be uh, informing our patients. Many times patients come to us and they come just for referral for some uh, issues and then we discover that they have a lot more going on and the information is the first element of our treatment. The other uh, component is education. So many times patients uh, who are um, busy with work, who are struggling many times with a social environment that is very challenging. Uh, patients have to work sometimes two, three jobs to make ends meet. Uh, they live in an environment where there is a food desert. There are no uh, whole foods, there are no uh, major um, venues for a healthy food purchase and when they are there they may not be able to afford it. Uh, it is um, incredible to see how expensive it can be uh, to uh, have a healthy lifestyle and many people don't have the place, don't have the means to uh, afford that. Then uh, the other component is education with regards to the importance of a uh, other healthy lifestyle choices, particularly activity. Weight loss is the most effective uh, way to reduce high blood pressure without pharmacologic intervention, to reduce the risk of diabetes. Uh, trials that have looked at activity as an intervention to reduce the risk of, di of uh, diabetes have shown that it is twice as effective as the best uh, drug that we have to reduce the risk of diabetes in patients who are at risk for diabetes. So uh, um, uh, counseling on this type of intervention, but also providing uh, logistical supports to uh, allow them to exercise, to have the time to exercise, to get the appropriate um, food on the table rather than just uh, having to go to uh, the frozen section of their local supermarket to get some mm, vegetables. Uh, those are some uh, of the aspects that we as physicians should be uh, focusing on. Uh, the um, other uh, aspects that we can use are smoking cessation. Smoking cessation is one of the uh, most challenging aspects of my practice. Many times and just I was in clinic this morning. I have a patient who had actually, he had a, a heart attack, but he's obviously at risk for stroke and he's taking his medication. His cholesterol went down to 52 of LDL, which is an excellent result. It was easy for him to take this pill, but he's still smoking. And I've tried with uh, smoking cessation counseling, then I've tried with pharmacologic intervention, with uh, nicotine lozenges, and now I have just one uh, uh, bullet left, which 
which is this other uh, drug, Varaniclin, that can uh, help him. But uh, it's been six months and still I have not been able to successfully have him s uh, quit smoking. So uh, the uh, importance of uh, addressing this issue is always uh, to um, uh, uh, remember, but also we should be able to uh, give uh, logistical support to our patients to make sure that they uh, have the means to uh, ob obtain good food and to exercise uh, many times. Now, uh, the last uh, but not least important aspect of education is the uh, awareness of what the symptoms of a stroke may be. Many times patients uh, are aware of having uh, you know, limb uh, weakness or having speech impairment. At the same time, they may not be aware that a transient change in their vision, blurriness in their vision, sometimes you know, transient loss that lasts a few minutes and they say, oh, okay, I had, you know, some um, black uh, view on my right eye, that's nothing to be worried about. And instead, if they had recognized that early sign of um, ischemia, that could have led to a more uh, uh, um, timely intervention and prevented maybe a disabling stroke. And that's why the uh, campaigns that the American Heart Association has been implementing uh, are of fundamental importance and are one of the most uh, useful tools that I can think of uh, to educate the public. Oh, thank you. So, uh, Walter, did you want to say anything about that? I do, I do want to move ahead with one other question. We'll give you a chance uh, to you, but to give you a chance to weigh in about that, about what can be done to, um, you know, to um, reduce some of these risk factors in patients? Well, I think uh, the lesson that we've learned to identify what the disparity is. Whoops. All agree make a difference, you can make a difference. So the best example is in looking at uh, hypertension control in African Americans, which as Janet mentioned, is way below what it is for Caucasians. Uh, and that was true across the country until many of the healthcare systems in Northern Cal California decided that they were going to take it on, and they completely obliterated the disparities. So I think the message is some problems, we don't know the answers and we can't fix them right now, but this is not one of those problems. We know how to fix this, we just need the, the force and the energy to do it. Um, Oh, go ahead. If I, I could just play off that. Thank you, Walter, for that uh, tee up. I just want to share one example of an innovative approach that, if scaled and spread, could really help us with blood pressure control. Um, the late uh, Ron Victor at Cedars Sinai has been working in barbershops across the country for years. You all know about this. But the last study that was published in the New England Journal showed a dramatic drop in blood pressure using a model that was randomized at the barbershop level. Um, for those of you, who, I see a lot of heads nodding in the room, but those of you online who might not know about this, they used a model where the uh, patrons of the barbershop were cared for by a pharmacist who was in the shop and was ref uh, patrons were referred to that pharmacist by the barber. Um, and in that model, the pharmacist was working with a clinician who was not in that office, but pharmacist working off a protocol, frequent visits, um, engagement and in education along uh, with that, um, and they showed a dramatic drop in blood pressure, much more so, three times more than most of the studies show. Um, so, so our model for blood pressure can use some innovating, mm. being based in the community, using a broad team, and then driving towards that result using a protocol that, again, could be administered by a team and supervised by a clinician. Interesting, yeah. very interesting. Um, Gokhan, what about the possibility of new drugs for stroke uh, recovery? Yeah, so when uh, an injury happens anywhere uh, in the body, including the brain, there, there is a series of events. So they're actually, they're intended to, to repair. For example, inflammation itself is a very necessary uh, response for an injured uh, organ or tissue. 
uh, but uh, these actually uh, are compromised either by the risk factors that cause the stroke or after a prolonged duration they themselves become damaging. So there are now, for example, immune cells will come to the environment to clean up the debris or start the healing process. But if you are suffering uh, from predisposing factors, the brain could be populated major uh, predominantly by the damaging types of immune cells. For example, the kind of macrophages, the presence of which uh, would not be very helpful. And there are now interventions, for example, to change the direction of these macrophages or immune cells uh, more towards a repair behavior. So this uh, and other ways that would facilitate, for example, resolution of the injury response or strengthening the neuronal survival despite the, the insult are uh, very promising uh, drug development uh, avenues. But maybe I, I want to mention again uh, two things. Maybe speaking of disparities, there are even, I mean, more basic uh, disparities that we haven't really had a chance to talk about. For example, difference between males and, and, and females. And this uh, uh, obviously will play into uh, both management or risk factors, uh, testing of drugs. For example, m still many clinical trials are biased uh, between males and females and also selecting the, the appropriate intervention. Again, young and old, for example, very different uh, set of risk factors and uh, responses. And lastly, I think we have now great tools to really do things with higher precision. And many of the, I mean, I completely agree with, with what Umberto says. So there are lots of things that can be done and should be done more effectively with lifestyle, uh, you know, changes in, in habits, the, you know, dietary routines and so on. But uh, our success rate is not great in implementing this. So, of course, there are many reasons, part of which is we're not able to implement these effectively and broadly around the world. The second, perhaps, uh, possibility to consider is that people need help. Uh, so, uh, if we can reduce the threshold uh, by which people will benefit from their changes in lifestyle. Uh, for example, Umberto was referring maybe a little chemical needs for someone who's trying to quit, or a little medic me uh, medicinal help for someone who's trying to lose weight. Uh, these will be very important. There will never be a, a magic drug that you will take and it will prevent all the risk factors. So I think if people are waiting for this, it is not going to happen for several centuries. So you really have to, even if there are wonderful medications, you'll still have to work and change your uh, lifestyle to benefit from these. But you said there's not going to be a magic uh, bullet or pill for, for preventing stroke, but also seems one of the issues is that there's a lot of, um, seems to be f some confusion or a lack of consensus about stroke guidelines. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that, about this kind of confusion that exists with the medical community? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, I have colleagues here who are much more knowledgeable uh, on that topic. I I'll leave uh, commenting on that, but I think part of that really deals with uh, maybe gaps in our understanding of the mechanism. So if we can't understand the, the mechanism giving rise to a disease, it is very difficult to make the, the most effective recommendations, whether they are preventive, uh, lifestyle changes, or medications. and. With the same token, if we look at the medications available to us right now, for example, things to treat uh, diabetes, things to treat uh, uh, dyslipidemias, high cholesterol, many of these are not really targeting the mechanism that gave rise to that problem in the first place. They're just dealing with the problems. Most diabetes drugs reduce blood glucose. Uh, most dyslipidemia drugs reduce lipids. But they don't really target the original mechanism which gave rise to that abnormality in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think we do have the tools now, so we don't have to limit ourselves with uh, the traditional measures or things that are uh, available as low-hanging fruits anymore. So we can develop much better biomarkers. There are biomarkers right now, the combination of which, for example, can uh, determine risk for diabetes with great accuracy. In type 1 diabetes, this could be up to 99.9 percent. .9%. So everyone who is going to develop type 1 diabetes could actually be predetermined. Mm. And similar 
approaches are now with the advances in proteomics and, and metabolomics, so the ability to look into all things in, in blood to determine risk factors for obesity, uh, other complica complicating factors, and, and stroke. So this might be one area which will increase the efficacy and maybe reduce the debate on what to do. Well, let me, let me ask each of you also, so Umberto, what's your perspective on this about how, to, how doctors should be advising their patients? Uh, I think that the way that we should f uh, approach is would be first to establish a trustful relationship. You need to have a um, patient that trusts you so that you can build a relationship that goes beyond the simple prescription of a medication or an exercise program. The uh, Once you establish that trust and that relationship, then I think it's a work that has to be done uh, together. You have to assess what really is the uh, patient's ability to uh, follow your, uh, uh, your prescription, the ability to uh, <coughs> achieve the goals that you want them to achieve. And this is not a one-time stop. Uh, we need to work with the patient and see them frequently. I, and one of the aspects actually that is highlighted in the most recent uh, hypertension guidelines is a home monitoring system. So one of the things that I always try to do with my patients is to educate them uh, to use their blood pressure machines at home. If they don't have one, I try to get them mm, one if they cannot afford them and uh, teach them the appropriate way so that they can measure their blood pressure. Many times uh, that empowers them and they can see how effective taking their medication is on keeping their blood pressure under control. Also, it can help to see if the patient has developed side effects, if they're developing low blood pressure. So it is a, a mutual uh, work that uh, in time uh, can achieve uh, important goals. The same is for uh, lipids, particularly with statins. Many times there is a, a lot of disinformation about statins and patients may be afraid of taking a statin. In most cases, patients can tolerate statins. If not, we have alternative treatments that can be as effective as statins now that can achieve the targets and uh, reduce the risk to where we want it to be. What about your perspective? And also, where can people go, the public go, to get more information about, about this? Yes, this I'm is for so you, glad for you, Umberto yes. brought up <laughs> home monitoring of blood pressure. I, I think the way you asked the question was, what can the clinician do, what can right. the doctor do? And I think it is, one of the things is to practice in teams and to make sure that that individual, that patient is Start, sort of the head of the team, um, but working with pharmacists, working with health coaches, um, working, we've done a project with community health centers across the country where they're helping uh, individuals who have high blood pressure use home monitoring. There's a wonderful video available on our website and I think also at nachc.org, um, but it, show, it tells the stories of people who are able to monitor and they're gaining control of their own blood pressure. The great thing from a clinical standpoint is it keeps you from over-treating someone or under-treating someone. So it is um, the best way to help achieve safe uh, and maintain safe levels of blood pressure control. Okay, thank you. Well, we've got a few minutes before we take some questions. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, stroke uh, and dementia. And uh, Walter, I think your sound is back on, so I wonder if you would talk with us about uh, the connection between stroke and Counting, dementia. so I guess we're good, huh? Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, as people probably know, I've heard that um, one of the great medical crises that's facing our country is the increase of dementia, uh, which occurs as our population ages. And um, so NIH and um, many people and institutions across the country are trying hard to kind of get ready for that and try to make a dent in that epidemic of dementia. Um, what we know, however, is that um, 
one thing that does seem to put you at very high risk of dementia is having a stroke. And also the vascular risk factors we talked about also contribute to your risk of developing cognitive impairment and dementia after stroke. Some of this we can actually see on MRI scans in the deep white matter parts of the brain where 80% of people who are 80 years old have developed abnormalities in this wiring of the brain, which we think is also related to this problem of cognitive impairment. And so we feel that the data is such that one other reason to control your vascular risk factors is to decrease your risk of dementia, along with decreasing your risk of heart attack and stroke. And so that's something we can put into play right away. There is, however, a great deal more to be learned about the individual person and what their individual risk factors are that contribute to their diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, which turns out to be in our country, not just Alzheimer's disease, but most of the people, especially the elderly who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, have a, have a combination of vascular disease and Alzheimer type biology. So this vascular component we've been talking about in relation to stroke is probably equally as important in your risk of developing dementia. And again, we think it's something that's modifiable for the reasons that people talked about today, whereas we don't yet have modifiers of the Alzheimer side of the equation. Okay, thank you. Um, Janet, did you want to talk about, about the, the link between dementia and stroke? No, I, Walter has covered okay. it beautifully. Um, one thing, uh, Gokhan, you... Um, <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we move on to Q&A because we want to end up with a kind of a prediction from everybody, but let's go briefly to Q&A if I can get the iPad up again. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this has come in uh, over the uh, internet. We'll come to the audience also, but I have a couple of questions here. Um, considering the numerous negative side effects, why is warfarin still being prescribed as treatment for recurrence of stroke as opposed to aspirin? It is cited that they were about equally effective. I think it's a citation of a 2001 New England Journal study. Who wants to take that one? Well, I would say it depends on the cause of the stroke. So uh, if we consider the main causes of stroke, we can uh, divide to, and we are talking about ischemic stroke. So a decreased blood flow to an area of the brain that causes a permanent damage. So if we consider the, the causes of the stroke, we can have either the mm, disease of the vessels that bring the blood to the brain, the carotids, and in that case, what happens is that the plaque, where the plaque, the cholesterol plaque is, has a sort of rough surface that causes the formation of clots, platelet clots, that eventually detach from that surface and travel towards the brain where can they block the um, blood flow. In that case, the treatment is with <coughs> aspirin or other agent that affect the sticking of the platelets. So we call the antiplatelets. We also have uh, other agents that can be used, but aspirin is the most common. Now, the other l large uh, contributor to stroke is the presence of clots that may form somewhere else in the circulation and then can travel to the brain. And the most common area where the uh, clot forms is in the heart. And this type of clots, clots is not um, affected by platelet to a significant extent is mostly the clotting factors in the blood that uh, sort of form this plug. In that case, warfarin is the treatment, or now we also have newer anticoagulants that uh, have overcome some of the limitations of warfarin. Now, in some patients, warfarin, despite the fact that it requires monitoring, despite the fact that it has um, uh, interaction with other drugs, with food, is the only option. If a patient has a mechanical valve in the heart, the novel treatments actually are not effective and we need to use the Coumadin. So e each patient may or may not uh, have a, an indication for aspirin or for coumadin or for another agent, and that has to be decided by the treating physician. Okay, thank Can I just you. interject a second? Because um, I think I, on this point, it's really important for the audience to know that one of the major stroke, severe stroke causes is what's called atrial fibrillation. 
And as was mentioned by Alberto, that's due to the fact that the heart is, is a problem. The atrium are not contracting and clots form in the heart and then they travel to the brain. And that has been shown by many NIH studies to be significantly preventable with anticoagulants like warfarin or the direct thrombin inhibitors. Uh, but again, the data out there is that people are being undertreated because of the complexities of using these medications. But there is nothing more complex to someone's life than suffering one of these strokes because the atrial fibrillation strokes are usually the worst strokes of all. Okay, one more question that's coming in advance over the, on, uh, online. Um, can you talk about the link between chronic stress, mental health, and stroke risk? It seems that the risk factors for stroke can also be connected to mental health needs, but these links may not be considered in the doctor's office. Who, is, who wants to take that question? Alberto? Yeah, yeah uh, Walter, go ahead. Go ahead, Walter. Right. So uh, I think that this is understudied, that uh, we know, for instance, that mortality rates are very high in people with autism and schizophrenia. Depression is not only a consequence of stroke, but it's a risk factor for stroke. And I don't think we understand exactly what the, all the, the whole story here. Clearly, we know about the things we know that they affect people's habits for eating, obesity, taking their medications, things like that. But I, I am, I think a lot of people are worried that there's biology here we don't quite understand yet, but it's a very important question. Okay, maybe we take one from the audience. We have time for one of the audience. I think we have microphones around. If, does anyone have any questions here? Yes, <clears throat> hi, I'm Dr. Enrique Caballero. I'm an endocrinologist. I work here at Harvard Medical School. I want to ask you about the prevention uh, focus that you all actually talked about. Uh, that to me is crucial because you all mentioned uh, very rightfully so that uh, most strokes can be prevented. Um, I've been a co-investigator in the National Diabetes Prevention Program that Dr. Campia was referring to. Uh, and despite all the information out there about the fact that we can prevent diabetes, very few um, programs have been implemented throughout the country. And I think that our healthcare system focuses mostly on the treatment of the diseases and not on prevention uh, programs and strategies. I'm talking more about community health level, primary care health level. Um, and the same thing may apply to other factors like hypertension, obesity, et cetera. Um, what do we need to do? What, what concrete steps do you think that we should follow in order to um, allow the healthcare system to better embrace prevention programs. I know reimbursement models are not working that well, et cetera. So in addition to improving treatment uh, to people with strokes, how can we truly emphasize prevention programs? Well, I, I will uh, ring the bell for value-based payment. I, I don't know anyone <clears throat> who's serious about care delivery who doesn't believe that that would be a better model. The devil will be in the details. But it's not uh, occurring fast enough. The transition is not occurring fast enough. And I know many clinicians feel like they have one leg in fee-for-service and one in value-based, and they're going to get split because it's, it's just not um, working well enough. We do know that when you are uh, rewarded for the outcomes you and your patients achieve, you are able to pay for the right team members. You might not be the best you might not be the best person to counsel your, your patient on physical activity or changing habits, uh, but there are people out there that are really good at it. You need to be able to hire them. Um, likewise, you need the technology that helps you comb through your electronic health record and find out where the gaps are. Um, who's not getting a statin? Who's a smoker and didn't get cessation treatment? Um, numerous examples of the, of the way you would practice if you were really just rewarded for the outcome. So, Although it is happening too slowly and in too few places, I will keep advocating for that. And we're lucky in the Department of Health and Human Services because it is a priority there. Um, and I think although the models we've had to date have not returned the value that we all sought, they are being scrutinized and revised, and I think more models will be coming. Yeah, certainly, John, right, you're very humble because the Millions Heart program that you're running is targeting exactly this problem. So it's been a great, a great program. Thanks, Thank Walter. you. So uh, are there any more questions in the audience here? If not, we can go back to one more. I think another question too from that have come in online. Um, and this is something I guess Gokhan kind of alluded to. I don't know who the best person to take this is. What suggestions, medication, technologies, therapies, et cetera, 
um, do you have to regenerate brain cells years after a stroke uh, for one with left side paralysis? So it's fairly specific, but maybe uh, who's the person to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish there was uh, a, a single entity that I could say, okay, go buy this from the pharmacy. <laughs> but uh, although we're not there yet, I think we, we will be. So I'm extremely optimistic that there will be possibilities to replenish or repair the damaged uh, neurons uh, after stroke. But this is not uh, something that is uh, ready to be implemented at the moment. What about uh, another question here? It talks about um, uh, in, in preventing disability, so for recovery. I, I wonder if someone can talk about what are the, what, if someone who has just had a stroke, what are the things that they need to do to, to you know, avoid having long-term permanent disability? Do you want to take that one? You're nodding. Janet, uh, no, I was looking at Walter. Oh, okay, I think Walter, that's go. <coughs> right down this right. alley. Yeah, so sorry. The, yeah, so the interesting thing about stroke is that if the patient survives, the patient always gets better. The nervous system is trying to get better. That's the general rule. Most people look at the evidence, and with, with some exceptions, people usually get about 70% better, but then it stalls. And what we don't understand is how the brain is rewiring, because unfortunately, you can grow new skin cells, but you can't grow brain cells pretty much. So uh, what's happening is the, the brain is getting signals that there's a problem and it's trying to rewire. And sometimes that works, it works better in younger people and it does in older people. So there's a big emphasis trying to understand what, what is actually happening. How do those circuits then improve or compensate? The Brain Initiative is a major program out of the NIH, which is trying to develop the tools to let us see circuit activity. And I think it'll be express, especially valuable in trying to understand this process. What we do know is that rehabilitation, of intensive rehabilitation, seems to be the key um, to, rehab, to uh, regaining function again. So we've done studies at NIH looking at one technology versus another. What we find is that it's not the technology, but the intensity of the rehab. And sadly, in one of our studies, we compared what the standard rehab is to, and then brought in intensive rehab six months later and found that people improved. And this would not have happened in the, in the regular rehab situation. So I, we also think that in the country, people who need rehab are not getting the the level of intensity that will maximize their, their re functional return. So another thing we need to work on. Well, let me stay, stick with you there, Walter, because I want to finish up here uh, with ask, to ask each of the panelists to make a prediction about where we'll be in 10 years. It's a long time out for uh, this kind of thing, but let's give it a shot. If you can't do 10, maybe five. And, and think about you know, prevention, treatment, or recovery. What if, and Walter, 10 years now, one of those fields, what do you think we're going to be looking at? Well, so I'm a very, I'm an optimistic person. I'm going to say 10 years from now, 90% um, of people who have hypertension will have their hypertension controlled. And stroke, which, which was the third leading killer in the U.S., dropped to five, will drop to below 10. So that's my prediction for prevention. I think in treatment, I think we're going to have drugs that were talked about, which can extend the time window so that more people can benefit from taking the clot out. And then we actually figure out how to improve people who have a hemorrhage into their brain, which is something that has eluded us so far. And in recovery, I think we'll understand some of the mysteries about how the brain tries to recover, and we'll be able to tweak those to enhance the recovery in people who have stroke. Okay, well, wow, you, got, you took all three of those fields, so let's go around this way. Go, Khan. You've got a couple I'm minutes the NIH, left. I've got to cover it all. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, want, you can do all three or pick one of those. Tell us what we're going to be looking at in 10 years. Yeah, so I'm also an optimistic person. And so the, the things that I predict are first, the stroke uh, approach to stroke will be much uh, highly individualized, that there will be better. Uh, classification of stroke and then uh, more informed decisions uh, made both for prevention and treatment. The second is I think oftentimes we talk about treatment, we speak about mechanisms. We talk about prevention, we always talk about lifestyle. But th there is a, a very important component to prevention 
which is also mechanism based. Mm. So without understanding the root causes of disease, it is not possible to implement the most effective preventive strategies. So my prediction is 10 years from now, the approach to prevention will be transformed to a mechanistic based, uh, well informed uh, interventions and cheap and broadly applicable interventions uh, that can uh, penetrate into population. And I think in terms of treatment, I mean, I see that in, 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 in three areas. One is the repairing the brain. Uh, the other is, you know, helping the body with the disability. So there's actually a tremendous amount of engineering innovation that will uh, be extremely helpful to aid the body to deal uh, with the, the sequel of, of uh, stroke. And then the last is reversal, really. I think that's the ultimate endpoint is to develop the ways to, to reverse the damage, to reverse the sequel in, in the body or in the brain. So I don't know if it will happen in 10 years, but I'm very optimistic that it will happen in our lifetime, for sure. Okay, thank you. Umberto? Um, so I am an optimistic too. I remember <laughs> when I was in training in Italy in the 90s, uh, and we just had heard about the uh, approach with thrombolytics in stroke, and my professor was telling me, you know, I hope that some days we will be able to do it for our patients. And now it's not only that, we have thrombectomy, we have these incredibly successful uh, stories. And I hope that we continue with that trajectory, particularly with the new technologies. The, with regards to prevention, I hope that the disparities that we see now in 10 years will be sort of a history of the past and we will look at us uh, our, uh, and think, well, uh, what were we waiting for? The uh, other optimistic aspect is that we have new drugs for prevention. We have the PCSK9 that are new uh, drugs to lower cholesterol that can draw the LDL, the bad cholesterol, to levels that we had not ever thought possible. And now uh, I treat my patients to uh, the targets that 10 years ago were considered you know, science fiction. So in the last aspect, I think that we will have a, a better understanding of the uh, prevention strategies at a population level that uh, are going to be as successful as the overall smoking cessation with regards to the control of the obesity and diabetes epidemic. Thank you. So you get the last word here. I'd like to sign up for all of those things. Um, and I'd also say that at home with the uh, Million Hearts team, my nickname is Donna Quixote. So I am also somewhat of an optimist or, or at least a windmill tilter. But the changes that I want to see in uh, 20 years, uh, 10 years, 10 years, is that when we talk about, um, we believe that heart disease and stroke can actually be prevented, but it's gonna take public health and healthcare doing what they do best, not doing the same things, but doing what they do best and complementing each other. So I want in 2028 that the concept of public health and healthcare working together is not something that people go, oh yeah, that'd be cool, but that we're actually seeing that happen. I think the other thing I wanna see is that individuals are empowered. They have what they need to be healthy. They are choosing those healthy things. We found the, we've cracked the code on behavior change in a way that um, helps move all of these trends in the other direction. We've tapped into the power of peers. The other thing I wanna see is I wanna see data that's available, that's trusted, uh, that we get on a timely basis. We've seen some of that happen within healthcare systems. It's not helping, it's not happening between healthcare systems. An example is that Million Hearts ran for five years and the first five years ended in 2016. I won't know until 2019 how many events were prevented. That is wrong we have to have better access to more timely data. And then the last thing is about social norms, gets back to that peer power. <clears throat> right, how do we get to a place where healthy is the thing everybody wants to be? And that we're willing to, and we can, invest in our own health and our family's health in a way that is reinforced. So that blood pressure control, we wouldn't let anyone go around without their blood pressure under control. We wouldn't let someone bounce around in a seat without a seat belt. We don't like it if somebody rides a bike without a helmet. And so how can we get to a place, hopefully before 
2028, mm -hmm. where we have that same sort of norm about blood pressure control. Okay, thank you. That's the, the end of this. So thanks to the panelists, Janet, Umberto, Gokhan, Walter, thank you very much. And thanks to the audience here and online. And I just want to mention a shout out to the next uh, uh, forum, which will be on the 2018 midterm elections, key issues for healthcare. That'll be from noon to one on November 1st, 2018, here and at forum.hsph.org. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.